So today we have uh, Richard Koningsberg and he is the director of the Library for Social Science and writes extensively on issues concerning psychoanalysis and uh, national socialism, uh, Hitler, ideology, politics, and other contemporary issues. Um, so anything else you wanna to add to your introduction there? No, that's fine. Okay, so um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, you've had a long interest in, in the issue of, um, of Hitler and Hitler's ideology and of Nazism. Um, so I wanted to ask you, like, why do you think it's still important to study that today? Okay, that's a good question. Um, what it finally turns out that I discovered through these many years of research was that actually the Holocaust was a function of war. So war was the independent variable and the Holocaust was the dependent variable. So Hitler fought in the First World War. So the Holocaust reveals the meaning of war. And I will get into that as we progress. But somehow Hitler had some deep insight into the nature of war. And if I want to get right to the crux of, of what he said about it, the connection, um, and this was in 1941 and 1942, Bob, when the Holocaust began, and here was his justification. Nature is cruel, therefore we may be cruel. If I don't mind sending the pick of the German people into the hell of war without regret for the shedding of valuable German blood, then I have naturally the right to destroy millions of men of inferior races who increase like Burma. Do you understand what that means? Yeah, so, so one thing one would ask then is, um, so obviously anti-Semitism pre-existed um, the Nazis and Hitler's ideology. So um, how did anti-Semitism um, relate to this uh, theory of war that you're presenting? Okay, so I'm a, a psychoanalytic anthropologist and you also are a, uh, a psychoanalytically oriented human being. So Hannah Arendt once said, anti-Semitism explains everything and therefore nothing. In other words, it's just a word. The question is, what is the unconscious meaning of anti-Semitism? So all my work, and this I, I wrote to you about, revolves around taking the ideology and looking at the underlying sources of the appeal of the ideology. And this is why, my, why people like me were out of it for so many years, because what took over was this idea of discourse, right? And Lacan is somewhat related to that, but let's take Foucault. And they would say things like, where would an idea come from if not from a societal discourse? So my fundamental theoretical question is, what is the source of a discourse and why does it, uh, uh, why is it attractive to people in a society? So the question of anti-Semitism is the question of what anti-Semitism meant, first of all, to Hitler, and second of all, to all the German people. So there are psychological causes why people embrace ideology. So, oh, I think you turned off the video. Okay, yeah. so I'll ask the question while you hopefully get reconnected with your video. So what, uh, the follow-up question is, um, in an article you write about um, the fantasy of an omnipotent object bound to the self. And I was hoping you could like kind of explain what that means, like the fantasy of an omnipotent object bound to the self and how that relates to um, this fantasy structure. Okay, so that's something that you picked up, right? This is, uh, this is, you know, not at the essence of everything I've written, but it's very important. An omnipotent object bound to the self is when you identify with some object, like a nation, and internalize it and make it part of yourself. So one's own omnipotence is bound up with the object with which one identifies. So, uh, you, we call that projective identification. Uh, so, you know, Hitler's uh, 
you know, Rolf Hess used to say, Hitler is Germany, just as Germany is Hitler. So Hitler had basically no personality. I mean, a little bit, but fundamentally his whole personality was based on his internalization of Germany into himself. And that function to hold him together. This is why this term disintegration is so important in its literature. His fantasy was that the nation was disintegrated. And like a psychotic, if the nation disintegrated, therefore he would disintegrate. So his struggle, Mein Kampf, was a struggle to keep Germany alive at all costs. Now, that object attached to the self for somebody like me, or maybe for somebody like you, can also be the oppressor. So what the left-wingers talk about oppression, they're really talking about an object that is inside themselves. Because if you're a Buddhist and you separate from the quote unquote symbolic order, then what's the big deal? It's only when you identify with an omnipotent object that you feel oppressed by that object. So I live in my apartment. So nobody comes into my, you know, I have a good lock at the door, I have Mayha to protect me. Nobody comes here to bother me. Now, I still have an internalized object of the academic community that has different opinions than I do, but that's what I mean. It's an idea that is identified within yourself it's very powerful, could be the mother, could be the father, could be the nation, which is identified with, with which the individual identifies. So like if you're trying to use psychoanalysis with an individual and you're going and you're exploring their unconscious or they're exploring their unconscious and you're using free association and the analyst is remaining neutral or you know, if, if in Freudian analysis, um, what's the parallel for political science in the sense like, what, how do we, what can we do to help people overcome, like, or society overcome its political fantasies? Yeah, well, that, that's what I've been trying to deal with for all these years. Uh, I have a paper right at the beginning, actually, the, the first thing that Mark Crocker published uh, by myself is called Awakening from the Nightmare of History how do we awaken from our collective nightmare? Now, the first thing I would say uh, is you have to recognize right now, American culture seems to me to be a collective nightmare. It's, it's chaos. So, I mean, I really admire you for trying to study it because it's so chaotic. And as you point out about the internet, this is very important insight you had Anybody can upload anything nowadays. This is the most important single change in American culture. It used to be, you know, that the best thing you could do would be a letter to the editor in New York Times Magazine. Now, everybody in the world has their say. And as the postmoderns used to say, you know, one discourse is as good as the other. He heard the title, you know, um, I, I once had an argument at a conference with a lady and uh, she was Korean and she was talking about how, uh, you know, the typical thing, American are oppressed and everything, oppressors and everything like that. Well, I actually dated uh, a Korean woman and, and, you know, she had welts on her body because the Korean men free, in that generation freely beat the women. So uh, I told her that, I said, you know, you just internalizing the academic discourse that Americans are such oppressors. I know Korean women. I knew many Korean women. And she said, I don't think I like your discourse if you walked away. Yeah. So also, you know, Freud spends a lot of time in um, groups analysis, group psychology analysis of the um, ego. You know, talking about his model is hypnosis, right? For um, why someone submits to, um, an authority figure, like he looks at the church, he looks at the army, political rallies, and then he also looks at love, passionate love relationships. And 
in all of these different social formations, he focuses on um, his experience he had as a hypnotist, right? And, and, you know, so the question is like, you know, what drives people to submit to the will of an other um, and suspend all of their reality testing and all of their, le- their conscience? Um, is it a regression to like an infantile relationship, do you think? Or is it just um, the way that fantasies work in people's unconscious? Well, it could be both. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we never thought it would happen in America. Uh, let's be honest, uh, Trump was a kind of shock to the American nervous system because we had a tradition of 200 years of freedom. And, and I kind of, I'm an American, you know, I, I respect George Washington. I, I respect Thomas Jefferson. Even if he had sex with the black women now and then, I, I don't make a big deal out of that. The, the, the Declaration of Independence is one of the greatest documents in human history. And if you study other cultures as I have, before I met Meha, I met her because I studied Asian cultures. I saw 200 Chinese movies. So the idea of freedom is an almost unknown idea in most parts of the world. I mean, in India, in China, they, and look at what's happening in China now. Uh, you know, they don't have the idea of freedom in most parts of the world. So even though we were brought up, I was brought up in Western civilization, right? We didn't read any, we read Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and then right up to Rousseau. So, so we had a tradition, we, and then Thomas Jefferson, and then Washington, we have a tradition of freedom. But the default position, which, which we don't understand, is submission. And this is true uh, in Asian cultures. So uh, before you explore the psychology of it, you have to look at it in terms of culture. So India, for example, this was the first Asian culture that I explored. And um, I met a beautiful Indian women. And this was, you know, I'm pretty old. So people didn't recognize Asian women in those days. They were like a, a foreign species. So, so I had my pickings. So I, I dated her a couple of times and she always used to meet me in the lobby of her uh, place where she was staying with her uncle uh, on 86th Street. And I always used to wonder, you know, why couldn't I just come and pick her up? So one time I hadn't seen her for a while. Uh, they sensed something was going on, her and her relatives in South Africa, she's considered black by the way, in South Africa was, So I decided to call her up and and I said, may I speak to Regina? Her name is Regina Nadu. And her uncle got on the phone. He says, who is it? And I said, I'm a friend of hers. No, you're not. I said, yes, I am. Could you please put her on the phone? He said, if you call again, I'll cut your nose off. Uh, Now, if you go to Indian movies, you find this theme over and over again. In fact, the first Indian movie I saw the man shot the Indian woman's lover. So, and they have arranged marriages. So they will tell you, and you probably know some more modern Indian woman, oh, we don't have arranged marriages anymore. You scratch the surface, nearly 90% still marry according to what their parents tell them to do. So, uh, so what was the question again? No, so um, I'm getting at the question of like why people submit to um, authority or why they, um, the hypnotic foundation that Freud found in these different forms of social relationships. But um, an- another related topic we were um, talking about before is question of like, why do people, so many people believe in these conspiracy theories? And um, one of the things that you're talking about is freedom. But if you look at the way that the right has used freedom, like the free market, free speech, and libertarian freedom. They've kind of used, some people say they've weaponized freedom as this um, way of basically promoting a selfish attitude that goes against society to say that basically we don't need taxes, we don't need government, we don't need welfare, we don't need social programs, we don't need education, we don't need any of these things um, because the individual should be free even to 
not wear a mask, not to get a vaccine, to go out in public, to infect other people. So hasn't this like idea of freedom that you were talking about earlier been somehow like manipulated from the right in order to, um, as a political weapon? Well, it's also in the rock and roll tradition. We don't need no education. Boom. We don't Remember, need this, is, this is going out to the world. So you're, you're singing like this video can go. Well, I, I, I'm a singer. Uh, you know, yes. that's part of my identity. I, I would like to make it more of my identity. But you know that song, right? Yes. We don't need no education. Pink Floyd, yes. Yeah, it's the same idea. So yeah, they, uh, but it's not as complicated as you're saying. I mean, when I was young, uh, and again, this is not in other cultures. And my father would tell me to do something. It might be good for me. I would say it's a free country. So even from age four, I used the idea of freedom as a rebellion against authority. So I think these people, without going into all the other things you said, and, and this is something I would love you to do a study of, it's just the, you know, taking this idea of freedom to an extreme. I mean, nobody can tell me what to do. I'm a free man. Nobody can tell me what to do. This idea, this is a, an American idea. And they take, like all good ideas, they take it to a bizarre conclusion. No, no nobody's going to tell me what to do. And I'm focusing just on the vaccines. Of course, it's bizarre. And on their deathbeds, you see this all the time. These people that say, I'm not going to take the vaccine. And then they're dying, right? Uh, so, you know. Uh, to me, the ultimate right. image of this was um, during the uh, insurrection, wherever you want to call it, January 6th, um, a guy had a flag said, don't tread on me, right? Which is like a Southern rights, you know, freedom, libertarian freedom sign. And he got trampled on by other protesters. And I thought that was so great. Like, don't tread yeah. on me. And he's being like almost killed by being trampled on and people well, said oh, give me covid or give me the li life or something liberty and it's just like it's yeah it's, it's come to an extreme so like where do you put yourself politically because you seem to have been you said you've said critical things about the left especially the academic left critical things about the right um what do you think is like you know a better political ideology to promote uh, you know, in all my writings, somebody uh, wrote to me the other day about using the term evil. And I realized I've written like, you know, 100,000 words about Hitler, uh, and I never used the word evil. It goes with, without saying, I mean, anybody can say that. Even Robert Lifton, when I was in a seminar with him, he said, of course, uh, uh, understanding does not justify. I mean, I, I never... I'm, I'm really a scientist. This is where I'm different than most scholars. I, I, I studied experimental psychology. I just analyze the roots of various ideologies. I have never taken a political stance on anything. So uh, am I left wing, right wing? No, I, I, I would say if I, you know, when I want to get away from that, I would go into a Buddhist state. So I, I believe in separation from ideology. And and yet, you know, you're doing a great job in writing. I've read some of your stuff, but it's basically hopeless if you really understand fantasy and the unconscious. I, I at one point during the Iraq war, I was working with somebody and I actually got paid five thousand dollars for lecture. He took me on. He had his own lecture bureau. And I was lecturing and he really understood my work. He wasn't an academic, he didn't fight with me. He just recorded everything and wanted me to present it. So at a, you know, at a certain point, the Iraq war just kept on going on. So we were out to lunch and he says, I said something, I, it looks like Bush and Condoleezza Rice are not reading, uh, listening to my lectures or reading my papers. And he, he got very depressed. And he came back, apparently, you know, who's you know, American who has these illusions that somehow what a scholar says is going to influence people in power. So, you know, if I were a senator, I might have something to say, but, you know, I'm pretty realistic. Who cares what my opinions are about things? 
I have. So why do you continue to write and research and produce all this material and circulate all this information and, and books and stuff if you don't think it'll have a, a fundamental effect on Why that? did Darwin do that? I'm not sure. I don't know. He was trying to establish a theory. Why did the Einstein do it? I have a theory of culture, okay? I'm a theoretician. I mean, why would you look? Why? That's a strange thing for an academic to say. Why would you look down on theory? Most scientists are trying to solve certain problems in all, all fields. Now, in medicine, they may be looking for a cure, right? There's only one Janet, Jonathan Salt, or whatever his name was. He was from New Jersey. And I didn't like injections either, by the way. But I got one recently. No, I, I'm, a, I'm a theoretician. Um, uh, like Darwin, like Freud, uh, like so Do you think universities have lost that kind of basic theoretical um, drive or foundation instead they've become more advocates and more politically involved and, and less trying to look at things from a scientific perspective? Do you think yeah, that the- Yeah, and you're, you're trying to resist that. I'm outside that. I left the academic world 40 years ago. I see it at a distance. But it's, it's pathetic. I mean, the way they, like poor Jordan Peterson. Now, you may not agree with some of his theories, but he's a brilliant man. And he goes to lecture and he has people yelling at him and protesting. So the fact that you've resisted this somewhat is very unusual. Yeah, of course, that's all they do. They, I'm sure you've gotten in trouble sometime for something you said. That, yes, it's a mess, the, the academic world. And that's why I limit myself to, you know, the people on my mailing list. I'm just beginning to do this sort of thing. I'm coming out, you might say. I'm doing more YouTube lectures, but I'm very careful. I am not going to get into arguments with stupid people. If you're in the academic world, like 50% of your career and, and the books you write, you have to argue with bizarre points of view like the idea that neurochemistry has a role in psychoanalysis. Yeah, well, I think, you know, this is similar to my approach to teaching is, um, you know, I like these, this, the, you know, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. And I try to focus on the facts in the sense that I don't, a lot of people say, oh, we should have the classroom as an open, you know, conversation of different people's opinions, but it really should be a place where you're using the scientific method to seek out um, the truth and to use, you know, established methods. Um, and it's not about like opinion or personal opinion or personal beliefs or personal politics. And I think um, it's becoming harder and harder because I think students now come to the classroom wanting their teacher to take a political stance. And, I, and that comes a lot from the, the general culture. And so it's I read I read your stuff on that, you know, this uh, the, the guy that, that uh, went along to get along, right? He, he couldn't say certain things because uh, he, he wouldn't get promoted and tenure because the students would give him bad ratings. And as you pointed out brilliantly, uh, he claims that, that he's doing that so the next person wouldn't do it, but he fucking did it. He fucking sold out. So, you know, even so, there's a, you know, how, this is why I write from the point of view of my newsletter. I call it a space for freedom. And I've never gotten to pack. And I, people, when they first saw my newsletter, they said, how can you say things like that? How can you say things like that? So in my world, they have opting out as their choice. So if they're disturbed by my theory, they opt out, but they got, they're not going to fuck with me. And if they try, I have Mayhai here. And, and Chinese are different than Americans, okay? They will. Okay, I don't know. I don't really want to include that in this video. We okay. might get in trouble from our. <laughs> what did I say that was our, our Chinese sp sponsors? Um, oh, okay. Well, Chinese. Own everything now. Well, uh, well, look at China. You should watch some video. There's one man who makes videos about China. There, don't you notice that they're beating people with sticks if it's the most brutal culture in the world right now? Haven't you noticed that? 
there's a lot of competition from the most brutal country. I think the uh, Afghanistan is in Saudi Arabia. No, probably. no, but then you don't understand China. But Afghanistan, at least they, they talk to you. I mean, this guy who's in charge of China, he wants to take over. They, they, they follow people around, even the United States. If you even say, you know, you know China's doing, you have to, I'll send you a link to this guy. There's one very brave man who lived in China for many years and made videos for many years. He's very intelligent and he knows China backwards and forwards. And then he had to leave because they tried to kill him. Okay, well, we're going to try to get this video done and up soon. Um, and then you can circulate it on your newsletter or wh what have you. And it's been uh, really interesting to touch on many of your ideas and theories and uh, hopefully keep the conversation going. And so um, anything else you wanna add before we end? I'll probably promote some of your videos too. Okay, there you go. So um, well, enjoy your New York quarantine and uh, we'll talk again later. Okay, thank you, Robert. Yeah. I appreciate it.